We're ready. Okay, so maybe we'll start with your history, your story. Uh, how long have you got? <laughs> Uh, well, I started dancing at the age of six uh, in Brussels with a Russian teacher who was married to a Belgian. And I did one class and the teacher said to my mother, uh, uh, th this little girl has strong legs, so buy her some point shoes for her next class. So I did actually only about three or four classes as far as I remember, but no doubt the second and third and fourth were actually on point at six. And they were little black point shoes. But my theory is that um, I did have strong legs. If I didn't, uh, that would have been totally wrong. But I had no fear of, uh, of going on point. So I think it was quite useful, as were a number of things, of odd things in my life and career, dance, dance career. Um, I then had the extraordinary good fortune uh, to be taught by some of the very great Russians pre Vaganova days, the great Tamara Kasavina, who was Vaslav Nizhinsky's partner and one of the top dancers, uh, I think estimated at the time with Pavlova, just not quite as renowned worldwide. And she was extraordinary. She was probably 75 or 80 at that time had beautiful uh, grey hair with a purple rinse, a very, very deep voice, a beautiful deep voice. And I had the luck to have one class a week, which was a classical class, open class with professional dancers, and then uh, a mime class also once a week, where she taught the great mime scenes from uh, Sleeping Beauty, The Lilac Fairy, but also La Fille Malgardée, which uh, sometime previously she had taught the mime scene from Fee to F Sir Frederick Ashton um, because he was doing a new production at the time of Fee and he wanted to have the authentic mime scene of when she's, um, she doesn't know that Colas is in the haystack and uh, hidden and she's dreaming of when she's married and when she's going to have little children and so forth. So I have actually, as I was 10, 11 at the time, a sort of visual image of Kasavina showing this. And then I also worked with uh, Lubov Egorova, who was one of the greatest teachers, also a principal dancer from the Marinsky. And I worked with her daily for four years in Paris. Uh, again, they were open classes. I never, well, I did go to a proper proper ballet school. Um, but that was only for six weeks. Uh, it was the Legat school, another Nadine Nikolaeva Legat. And uh, she was a great character. She was, at that time, we're talking 1953, uh, she did yoga and she stood on her head every day and she was really eccentric. And she had us doing all the repertoire. Uh, this was before uh, Kalsavina, I was nine. And uh, she, I remember very vividly one night, it was a boarding school, and she had us uh, taken out of bed at midnight, taken over to the other house where the studios were, um, put on our point shoes, and uh, do fuetes. <laughs> at midnight, <laughs> your face is a picture. <laughs> Um, and again, one of those oddities, uh, hence I feel I was never frightened of fuetes. It was very handy when later I did things like Black Swan or Don Q, and it wasn't, I uh, felt a very good performance, but at least I could fall back on my fuetes, which the public always love. Um, I also worked with uh, a great man, uh, Stanislas Itzikowski, not so well known nowadays, but who was a famous bluebird with the Diaghilev company. And that was also in London. And he gave classes in a church hall, uh, which was very, very, very slippery. And he came to class dressed in an immaculate suit with a beautifully polished normal shoes. And he would show everything. He had a huge jump. He was very small, uh, beautifully proportioned and turned like a top in those shiny day shoes, beautifully polished, uh, would do eight, 10 turns. And he gave 
for true Cecchetti classes uh, because his master was Enrico Cecchetti himself, great, great teacher. And uh, there are lots of uh, Cecchetti systems now, but he really came from there. And his class was very interesting because it was, the bar was only 15 minutes. And after the, the, the plea is, the first step that we all do in, in class, the next step was great big grand battements. Um, eight front, eight front, eight side, eight side. Uh, so it was all very varied, very interesting. All those Russians, if they felt you had talent, screamed at you, um, sometimes hit you, but not hard. Um, I, I think, uh, as far as I remember, Itzikovsky had a little stick. Um, but it was exciting, it was stimulating. And I think somewhat like sports coaches, you know, the, the voice got you going. Now it's, it's not in fashion to <laughs> scream at dancers. You have to take kid gloves. <laughs> um, so that was some of my early, early training. Um, I counted once that I had 30 different teachers before I became professional, which was when I was 15. Uh, at least, I, yes, it was when I was 15. I went to the Royal Ballet School for six weeks, but I found it not stimulating. There were, I think I fell on the wrong teacher. She was quite young and she was very English. And after all that Russian excitement, it was, I didn't feel it was my thing. Uh, so I went back to Paris and I auditioned immediately for Roland Petit. And I got a job with Roland Petit for six months later. Um, but after the Royal Ballet School, I felt I sort of wanted to show that I could be a professional right away. So I got a job in a film, um, a ballet film, with a sort of diva of the dance and theatre who's called Ludmila Cherina, very, very beautiful. And she was the star of the film and I was one, practically one of the extras. And we had to, uh, uh, we had, we were ghosts and we had to have grey sort of plastic makeup all over us. It must have been extremely unhealthy. And it was a mad but very interesting stage director who was directing this film. And we were in the studio from 6 a.m. as they do in films till midnight. But we couldn't even leave the set. It was, it was also quite an experience. So then it was Roland Petit. Um, I was there for six months. I had auditioned for a program of ballets with Zizi Jean Mer as the star, um, but it then turned out that uh, it was her first singing tour de chant. Uh, the first part was all little snippets of ballets and the second part was Zizi singing. And we were dressed in Yves Saint Laurent stunning costumes and um, there was quite a bit of, of dance in it. We were not paid for rehearsals because in those days in France, you didn't get paid. And we didn't have classes provided, so we had to pay for our own classes. Um, there were more mad teachers in, in Paris, wonderful genius teachers. Um, Victor Gzowski, who was um, uh, always drunk, Quite a few were, were, were drunk, but, but gave wonderful classes. And, uh, and Reznikov and, and people that Roland Petit and Zizi Jean Mer went to class with, so we used to go to those same classes. So I did six month season, had enormous problems, practically had to, well, my mother had to go to a lawyer to get me out of the contract. Because I was, I was 16, so my mother had signed the contract. And I managed to get into the Marquis de Cuevas company, which was a touring company, sort of European equivalent of American Ballet Theatre. Um, but within six months it closed, for lack of funds, already then. <laughs> um, but that was very good experience in the Corps de Ballet. Then I joined a small company, Milorad Miskovic, and danced little bits of soloist roles. And then Rosella Hightower had opened her ballet centre in Cannes and she invited me to go and take some classes and participate in a performance that she was doing and dancing in, which was La Sylphide with Eric Brune. 
um, and Eric was staging it and dancing in it with Rosella Hightower. So that was another fabulous experience. Um, and uh, I was chosen as one of the lead sylphs in, in that. And then I, it was a real eye-opener to work with Rosella Hightower, who was a, a unique teacher. It was after I had been professional for a couple of years, and I felt that it was a wonderful time to expand because I felt I knew more about what I needed to go further in my career. And at the same time, we were performing gala performances, touring, we toured to China, and that was the first time I came to Australia because we came for four weeks, Sydney, Melbourne, Brisbane, and Perth, uh, and performed Giselle, I think Suite en Blanc, and uh, various mixed bills. Um, and that was also my first taste of Australian audiences, uh, who I thought were absolutely wonderful. They were so enthusiastic. Um, probably more as they are now, I think, bit by bit, they've got back to that enthusiasm. Because when I first came with the Australian ballet, I felt they were somewhat reserved in showing how they felt about a performance. But that was, a, that was a wonderful time because I was performing seven, eight performances a week in soloist and principal roles already. And we did one night stands in the United States. Um, so I was, I think it was two, three years, uh, certainly partly studying uh, because Rosella Hightower was also dancing in most of the tours, but there were no classes. So I would just work behind her when she was warming up and learned so much that way. Uh, and then one summer, Maurice Bejar came to uh, Rosella's school in Cannes and was guest teacher. And Maurice Bejar at the time was the epitome of contemporary dance, uh, something that I never thought I would uh, be at all interested in, neither to look at nor to be part of. Um, but I had seen his Rite of Spring and I did feel that was quite exceptional and extraordinary some years before. And I was very surprised that he was going to be guest teaching at all at the Hightower School. And when he started giving classes, I realized that he was giving uh, the most academic and correct classical ballet classes. And he was also an absolutely fascinating personality and character who had so much knowledge uh, about dance, but also about all the other arts and philosophy. His father was a very well-known philosopher. Uh, so I was fascinated and Rosella took us to see some performances of his company in Avignon. And I just thought, this is, this is what I have to do. I've always loved to dance. I've always thought that that was something that I wanted to explore and that there were roles that I really wanted to do, like Giselle and Swan Lake. Um, but I never felt that what I was doing was of that much importance in the world, if you want. And through Beja, who had, and some people think it's a dreadful thing, big philosophical messages to, to make. And he also attracted an enormous audience of non balletomans balletomans as well, um, but people who knew nothing about dance, but who were completely drawn to dance through what he had to say, through dance and through his dancers. So I felt I had to, I had to get in there. And suddenly I realized how important I felt that dance was in general, not just to me. So it took a year until he had a, a vacancy and eventually I joined his company and had a fabulous four years there when he was really at the peak of his creativity. And uh, he made a lot of, of, of ballets, um, not to the extent that I had hoped, I, because he was known for making wonderful ballets for men. And I thought, if I get in there, maybe I can get him to create uh, equally interesting, meaty roles for, for, for me. <laughs> um, 
they were meteor rolls, but often ab abstract, uh, like bhakti, which um, uh, was an, uh, a ballet based on Indian um, mythology. Um, and I was Shakti, the goddess of dance, the goddess of also of destruction and resurrection, like a sort of phoenix. Um, but that's a very abstract concept, and I did like more storytelling. And he often he did ballets, well, later, like Nijinsky, but also Romeo and Juliet was very much in the repertoire. But I didn't get those sort of roles. But I had a fabulous time and, uh, again, learnt so very much from that experience. And then, uh, towards the end of uh, four years, Rosella Hightower telephoned and said that she was, at the time, director of the Marseille Ballet. And she was staging a production of The Sleeping Beauty. And she was supposed to... Um, Rudolf Nureyev was coming to dance the role of a prince, and supposedly with Noëlla Pontois, who was a great star of the Paris Opera. But Noëlla was not well, and she needed an aurora, and she asked if I could do aurora. I had never done a full-length ballet. I had done one-act ballets. And... Uh, so, of course, I was very, very excited, but I didn't think that Béjar would give permission while I was with him, because that sort of guesting around, which is now the norm, was not at all, and especially in a company like Béjar's. Um, but he was a fr very friendly with Rosella, and he gave permission. So I had all of two weeks while I was performing with Béjar to prepare. I knew the role, of course, from my, my times with the Russians and, and lots of repertoire classes. Uh, so I worked on it in the evenings, and then I went to Barcelona, where it was to be performed the day before the dress rehearsal, and Noriev arrived, and there was only one tiny little studio downstairs. Uh, the stage was extremely raked, and downstairs it was uh, a studio that was about not even a quarter of the size of the stage, and it was flat. But we got the sort of versions together of the pas de deux, and then we did the dress rehearsal, and then we did five performances in a row. So that was a pretty fabulous experience, and he was extremely helpful um, and really lovely, not just as a partner, but also just helpful in, in general. And we'd go out to dinner after the show with Rosella, with, with uh, Nureyev, and I got to know some of his idiosyncrasies and adopted some of them, like not... Um, um, he didn't want fat on his meat, uh, he liked his good steak. So when the restaurant provided, um, you know, all oily, especially in, in Spain, they like oily food, so he'd take his napkin out and just wrap it around the steak, to <laughs> blot like blotting paper, <laughs> silly things like that, I have memories of. And um, that really led me to leave the Bejar company because I decided that I really wanted to explore the classics more. And um, I left with a very, very well with, with Maurice, and he allowed me to do some of his ballets um, in other companies. I joined London Festival Ballet. First I joined the Berlin company, the, uh, the company in uh, the Deutsche Oper Berlin, which at the time were, the artistic advisor was Balanchine, because I thought it would be great fun to go from Beja, choreographer for men, to Balanchine, choreographer for women, and see if I could um, learn a, a great deal there. But Balanchine, I think, had the wrong idea about me, and he thought that I was, um, you know, wanted to be a star, and that his company was not like that. But he suggested that I go to Berlin for a year, and then he would see uh, whether I fitted in with the repertoire, and I suppose whether I was a snooty star type of person who wouldn't fit in. And, but what actually happened was that I was not very good in the Balanchine ballets, and it didn't eventuate. One never realizes it oneself. One, I, I sort of did realize, but I still didn't understand why he wasn't taking me. Um, but on my way to New York to sort of beg him to give me a position and this, tell him that I, I didn't mind not being a principal. Um, 
I went via London and went to a performance of London Festival Ballet. Beryl Gray was the, the um, director at the time. I was introduced to her and she asked me to guest with London Festival Ballet in Swan Lake. I had, I had some guesting also in Bejar Works with the Budapest Opera. Uh, a whole evening of Bejar Works and he sent some of his male dancers to dance with me. Th just three of us did an evening. And another evening I did my first Swan Lake in Budapest. So I think I had said this to Beryl. And so she invited me to guest to do Swan Lake. Then the next week to do Nutcracker, uh, which I'd never done, but I said, yes, yes, of course, and concocted a version. I always went on with, with virtually no rehearsals. And then she invited me to join the company, and then I was four years with London Festival Ballet. Uh, danced all the classical roles there. Also usually with very little rehearsal, because there was only one rehearsal room. Uh, and I think it was handy because I could be thrown on and do a reasonable job. But then after a while I felt I was just repeating myself and I was always hankering after really good coaching. And I would go to Denmark to be coached by a great Vera Volkova for Sleeping Beauty after I had done it many times. And I managed to grab uh, Tony Lander to uh, rehearse me in Etude, which I had learnt at the back of a rehearsal. No videos, no notation at the time. And then I left uh, London Festival Ballet, joined the Sadler's Wells Royal, um, because I felt there would be more opportunity, more studios availability. Uh, Peter Wright was a wonderful coach, and I was there as a guest first, and then for a little while as a, as a principal. And then I started freelancing. I devised my own performance with this um, bee in my bonnet about coaching, because I saw some very great dancers who I felt were not being used to pass on the great tradition, such as Svetlana Beriosova. And I got this idea for a show, showing an audience the background of how dancers uh, are rehearsed, how uh, a pas de deux comes about. Sometimes um, the man and the woman have done different versions and they come together for a gala and they have to very quickly get together a version. And I, I sort of made up a day in the life of a couple of dancers. And that show became enormously successful. Uh, it started out in a little fringe theatre in London we're in a theatre with 100 seats. And um, then we went on to the Royal Court Theatre, which was available uh, for a week. And we went on to the Ambassadors of West End Theatre for two weeks and we sold out. And then it started touring and we went to South Africa and we came to Australia. And I think it's partly due to that show um, and my experience, although it was um, a show that just involved um, eight, ten people all together, um, but it was a little bit a managing situation as well as acting and dancing in this show. Uh, and at the same time, I was guesting in a lot of different companies, including the Australian Ballet, Bobby Helpman, Sir Robert asked me to guest in The Sleeping Beauty, and I performed, um, I think it was 1980, oh, I'm so bad with dates, something like 85. And then uh, he asked me again to, da to dance La Fille Malgardée. And then uh, I did a solo that Béjar had uh, choreographed for me, which became nicknamed The Squeaky Door. Uh, which I also performed here, and the wonderful experience of doing Cranko's Romeo and Juliet. So at last I got to do Juliet, and I had five weeks to rehearse. I mean, a dream come true. And I thought the Australian Ballet, they have time to rehearse. They have four studios, even if it was with the school. Um, and Anne Williams was, at the time, staging, she wasn't yet director, but she was staging Romeo and Juliet, and she was a fabulous coach. So all these experiences, 
And then after a while of guesting, I felt that I wanted and needed, um, because it was a very ad hoc uh, life and career by then. Um, but I needed really a permanent company uh, to be able to go further in my career. And that didn't eventuate. So I thought I'd try something else. And I was interested always in teaching, in coaching, and a little bit in choreographing. So I got the opportunity to choreograph uh, a little ballet for London City Ballet, which was a small touring company in, in England. And I decided that I'm going to have a trial retirement. And I didn't tell my mother, because I knew she would be very, very upset. So she, somehow I did some sort of interview and it came out that I was doing my last performances on a cruise, actually, in a, on a boat, uh, a very grand cruise. And so she read in the paper that I was <laughs> retiring. But it was only a trial in my mind anyway. I didn't want to do the big farewell business. And, uh, so I choreographed this ballet. I was given the opportunity to do some teaching and some coaching. And I had decided in my own mind if when I was rehearsing or when I was watching performances that I had coached, if there was the slightest inkling of, oh, I, I want to be up there, then it would be wrong for me to retire. And however hard it was, I would need to get myself back into dancing because it would be, it would be wrong for me, but most of all, it would be wrong for the dancers that I was coaching because I couldn't be thinking about them. I'd be thinking, oh, I can do this better or I, whatever. Um, but that didn't happen at all. I was just fascinated by the whole exploration of working with different dancers on different possibilities, um, working out how to, um, how to, how to prioritize, which is such a huge part of coaching because you all the time have to be thinking, now, who are these dancers in front of me? What challenges are facing them? What are their pluses? What are their minuses? How much time do they have before they get on stage in front of an audience for this role that they have never done before, that they have rehearsed before but never performed, that um, they have performed before but how long ago? There are all these factors that I feel need so much to influence how you're coaching the dancers and what you're saying. Because if you hark on some minuses that quite clearly there isn't time to um, either rub out uh, or to, um, to fake, because after all, performing is a lot of faking. Um, if you're acting, if you're dancing, most people don't have a perfect body. Most people are probably don't have the ideal amount of time to explore a character, to explore a ballet. But the audience has not got to know any of that. For the audience, it's got to be in the present. Um, they've got to feel the emotion, they've got to be told the story, they've got to understand it. If, even if it's an abstract ballet, they've got to be taken with the movement, with the music, with something that draws them indelibly to that experience. Otherwise, I don't know what they're paying for, and it's, it's wrong. So we've got a big duty as coaches and as dancers to give the, dance, give the, the audiences um, a real experience that's going to take them out of themselves. <laughs> that was good timing. <laughs> Sorry, that was very long. No, it's wonderful. I'm just conscious of the time. Yes. So we have about five minutes. Should we push on to some Giselle? Just quickly some Giselle. Um, uh, perhaps uh, some of the things you always tell your Giselles and Albrechts when you're coaching them. Um. 
Giselle, it's a, it's a whole adventure, uh, always, for the dancers and for those coaching them, and hopefully for the audience, most of all. Um, I always tell everyone involved with Giselle um, this lovely thing that in Russia, Giselle is known as the holy ballet, the spiritual ballet. Um, it, it, it becomes on a, on a completely different plane. That, that's one of the things that I talk about. Um, but I think it's extremely important that the Giselles and Albrechts have um, an understanding of the tradition, an understanding of how these roles were performed in the past. I mean choreographically as well as stylistically, uh, as well as how the storytelling evolved. And there are so many different theories um, that at one time uh, and in some production, Giselle commits suicide, for instance. In some productions, Albrecht is an out-and-out cad uh, who only realizes that he's fallen in love with Giselle as the first act goes on, and sometimes only as late as when she goes mad. Um, uh, while in other productions, um, and I've, well, I'll come back to that, but in other productions, uh, he can be just sick of the aristocracy, um, not interested in his fiancée, Bathilde, um, and have seen Giselle and fallen in love with her already before we see Giselle and Albrecht together when he knocks on the cottage door. So one of the first things we talk about is, well, this Giselle, this Albrecht, how do you see um, their, their meeting when the audience first sees you? Do you think you've met before? How many times have you met before? Um, uh, is Giselle expecting him or is that knock could be anybody? Um, there are so many possibilities. And I realize that I teach and coach Giselle completely differently from other ballets. Quite recently I've been coaching La Sylphide, both in Eric Brun's production and in my own production. Um, and although there is a lot of leeway for interpretation and creativity, but it's pretty set choreographically and the mime is very set on the music and so forth. In Giselle, there are, I feel there are many possibilities. I don't want to impose that Giselle is this way. You can have a Giselle come out of the house and obviously be really frail. You can see that she's not a well girl uh, and that the disaster is going to strike. But you can also see her come out and just the love of dance exude from her and the fact that she's not well comes as a shock. Uh, and as I say, you can have the different possibilities for Albrecht. Uh, I feel that it's very important that what I call the family um, works, that the characters of Giselle Albrecht Hilarion, um, her, her suitor, the, the person, the, the peasant guy, woodcutter, who's always been going to marry Giselle, that Wilfrid, the manservant of Albrecht, that these, these personalities, these characters fit together. Um, because you can have wonderful characters that work well as, the, as those, um, as a Hilarion, um, but who may, perhaps doesn't work particularly well for that Giselle and that Albrecht. And of course, that's a lovely idea. And then you have people who are uh, ill at the last minute and you have to adapt. And sometimes you get wonderful surprises and it all fits together wonderfully. But the corps de ballet also has a place in... Giselle, where they have a lot of leeway and they can, uh, and I, I always speak about the fact that they can work out how friendly they are with Giselle, the peasant girl. Um, are there special friends of Giselle? What do they think about this man who is dressed in, in peasant clothes but whom they don't know who must come from another village? 
um, are they suspicious, are they not? During the mad scene, there is little that is actually set. So they have the opportunity to empathize, sympathize. Some may be very close to mother, some they may be very close to Hilarion. So there's, there's a lot of creativity that can happen and every single person needs to be involved. And more often than, than not, they really are because somehow everyone loves Giselle. Um, this time with the Australian Ballet, it's an extraordinary time because it's a long time since Giselle has been staged. And um, most of the company, certainly those doing the principal roles, have not danced it before. So it's an entirely new exploration with them. In the second act, uh, it's much more set. Uh, and I think that the style is vital. I tell uh, companies where I stage this, and there have been about five different companies now, although the Australian Bunny has done it more often than any other, um, that uh, I like the first act to be as naturalistic as possible within the bounds of classical ballet, of course, um, while the second act to work and to look uh, as though the willies really come from another world um, and Giselle to be the spirit of love and forgiveness, um, the style, the romantic style lends itself to this and there's a great deal of work that needs to be done to make this feel natural. And curiously, that romantic style, which dates back, one can see it on the lithographs, all this floating feeling and, and the slightly unformed arms and peculiar neck feeling, um, relates in some ways to contemporary dance. So that nowadays, dancers who do a lot of contemporary, as this company has, and by, by this I mean the way that contemporary choreographers, usually not all of them, but make dancers use their, for their own weight and use their entire body and the weight of their body. If they're running somewhere, it's a reason to run. It's not just that you're walking beautifully. And if they do this in, in the, um, if they use the weight of their body and actually think heavy, what a contradiction, they look incredibly light and ethereal. I think that Giselle has lasted as long as it has and will go on as long as, long as ballet exists um, because it's the epitome of romanticism, uh, the love story of all time. At this time, like at any time in the past, present or future, people fall in love and it goes wrong. So. It's, it's as simplistic as that. I think when the story is really well told, uh, people feel concerned because it's happened to all of us. Is that okay? That's perfect. Yeah. Thanks. Good.